All right, this is six scale, it's December 7th, 23. All right, let me grab a lay of those. Um, where are, oh, do you have the... Um, at at the top. Yeah, yeah, I think you need to change in the URL from 125 to 127. What do I need to change? Uh, I think to, yeah. Oh, these, you mean? Oh, these. Oh, yes. okay. Um, okay. Got it. Yeah, yeah, let me. Okay, I'll, I'll change it in the, in the browser. Yeah, I'll have the updated links. There we go. Okay, there we go. Okay. So I took a brief uh, glance over all the graphs. Uh, and I think most of them look stable, except the get nodes count for VM. Yeah, I, I think we might have missed this in last couple of calls, but uh, somewhere around October, starting of October, there might have been a change, which increased the get call for nodes. <clears throat> That's interesting, because um, uh, we have no correlation. That's fascinating. Like, this is 100, this is 100 VMs. This is not, like, it's clearly not one-to-one, -one, but we somehow get about 10 more. Uh, I think we are doubling, right? So we are going from 19. Oh yeah, we are doubling. Yeah, you're right, we are doubling. So 20, 19, yeah, it's about, okay. But still though, I don't, I don't, so. Okay, so we're doubling, but um, I just find it interesting. So it's not, it's not one, it's not one VM to one get nodes call. It's something now it's now it's like we are whatever whatever is doing this is now doing it twice as often. Yeah. But it doesn't necessarily correlate to the number of VMs we have. Yeah. I mean this is just for VM VMs, right? Uh this pattern was not observed in VMI. Mm -hmm. There, the graph is not very, it's not very consistent. We get a spread yeah, from a zero little. to 40. I mean, apart from that, uh, other things look good. They are pretty consistent. Uh, we can do, uh, I don't remember the query for it. There's a query for date. Uh, let me see a quick look. <clears throat> hey, so I just left a link to the PR, uh, which might uh, explain the the increase in the node uh, node guess. Oh, nice. This was basically merged at uh, on October 2nd. Um, oh, yeah, it's the very same day we're seeing. Okay. Yeah. So there we go. <laughs> How about that? Okay. This is probably it then. Okay. So you've got a, yeah, you've got to get in here. It looks to be an addition, a clean addition. There's no subtraction. Okay. So, um, Lubo. This get should uh, affect both VMIs as well as VMs, right? Or is it just VMs? So it's a uh, it's a heartbeat. So it's a periodic uh, periodic routine. Uh, should not be really related to VMs or VMIs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I, I had a look at, at the code. Uh, uh, we could we could we could reduce it. So if we see it, it's. Uh, 
making some problems. We can get it done. Well, I think, um, I don't know if it's making problems, but it would be interesting. I, I mean, at least I would like to see this reported. Like uh, when we spot this stuff, like I like when we go to release, right? When we go to release one, two, what I'd like to see is that we say now we have two times as many get calls because of whatever reason. And that's that's what that's what I think would be interesting. I because like we don't know we don't know the effect of this. Like we don't we don't have a calculation that says what's the cost of this. So I mean our, our defense against this is to say that it's changed. So I think Ryan, we missed this, right? This might be one point one. Oh really? Yeah, unfortunately. Okay, so then I think we missed it. All right. Yeah, I get, I mean, we can still amend the the benchmarks PR uh, in the docs that we shipped. Yeah, we did. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think that would probably be a good idea. I think it's like when we come across these things, I think it's good to document them as, um, you know, when they occur, what release they happened. And then and that's, that's the, that's right. That's our best defense is whenever we see this stuff, let's just mark it. And, and we come back to it later if we have um, exact costs of these things, or if for whatever reason we, we come across a problem with get nodes, I don't know what, we would, what would be, but if for whatever reason we, we can see that there's an increase, then it's just something we need to factor in. Like, okay, we need to probably look at this PR again and, and reduce it. Yeah. Yeah, I can take action item to update the, the docs with this. Okay. All right. Let me. So we've got um, okay. One more thing I wanted to check. Uh, I did not dig in uh, a lot, but it looks like the the call there, it's not happening via cache the client. It's happening directly to API server. I was wondering if that's true. And if it is true, is there a reason why we need the heart rate to go to API server? So this call we we are looking at, yes, this is direct call to API. Um, I think, or I believe it could be cached because we already have one, one of those gets. So we could just do one and uh, share the results. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. I think that's good. Then, like you said, any more? Like you said that this was the only one. I think. Yeah. That's okay. Thing. All right. Cool. All right. I'm glad we caught that. So we'll get the we'll get that. Let's get that in the docs, and that will um just to mark the change. Okay. All right. Um, I think we're good on the benchmarks. Then let's go. Um, let's go to our next topic. So, like you want, you got the clock keyword demo. Why don't you take it away? Yeah. Sure. So I from our previous presentations, I put together a small set of slides. I'll just quickly walk through it uh, for for background and then um, I have a demo at the end of it. So um, so what are we trying to do, right? Um, there is a major challenge where we can't reach uh, target target object count in terms of number of nodes and number of VMIs uh, on the node uh, where we have physical and, and cost con constraints, right? So testing at the scale of some of the production environments might be really expensive and, and could turn out to be unrealistic. 
So now the next question is, why does high object uh, count matter? Uh, so there are three, well, two distinct things uh, that could be identified in our stack, right? One is the controls play, control plane's ability to scale. So when I say control plane, I mean uh, Kubernetes control plane. So HCD, um, API server, controller manager, um, as well as the uh, QWERT control plane. So yeah, I know this is missing in the diagram, but you can imagine Word API and Word controller to be falling in the same uh, realm of, of uh, things. So that's one thing. And the other thing is um, the consumers of those uh, control plane, right? So the, the controllers. So um, each controller has a informer, which has um, a cache of objects. That cache of objects fill up uh, with, with high number of objects. So um, all of these uh, consume memory as well as uh, CPU when, when receiving those watch events. So those are the two key things. And what we want to do is test the effect of code changes on both of these uh, uh, vectors, I would say. Okay, so in order to test this, right, what can we do in a cost-effective way? So if we take a step back and understand uh, what, what are the load generators for API server, right? So this is the Kubernetes control. Uh, it includes Kubelet, controller manager, networking, CSI, all of those components. So from these components, we would see a ton of um, list and watch calls when they initially start. So those would be uh, load generators for the API server. And then we'll also see some periodic updates, update calls or patch calls to uh, pods and node, nodes and, and other resources they are reconciling, right? So those all become uh, load generators against the control plane. And in addition, we do have other load generators like the Qbert stack, right? Um, we just saw the the benchmark numbers where a get node call increased, and that was a call against live API server. So those are the kinds of um, calls that the Qbert stack mail makes. The thing to call out here is the most expensive ones are, are the watch and the list calls. Uh, in terms of uh, memory, they are known to cause uh, a lot of problems against uh, APIs. Relatively, compared to the list and watch calls, the the update get uh, put, those are really small in terms of memory footprint uh, in APIs. So once, once we have you know, understood the API server, the next thing that comes in here is uh, this is the diagram of a typical uh, uh, informer, right? So informer is served by uh, this store and it, it makes this watch. In fact, the watch list request, which I was talking about earlier, is coming from when the informer starts. And when it starts, it lists all the objects and then it will watch for changes on those objects. So all those objects, they create load here in API server. And then when they flow through in the informer, they will also create a memory usage in all the informers. So if we want to uh, track, if we want to track the memory usage of a controller component, like a word controller, or uh, maybe word handler. Uh, this is where a lot of memory is spent in, in storing these objects. Okay, so quickly moving through with this background, where Quark will be interesting is that we can get a set of uh, large number of nodes, pods, and VMIs, uh, and we can test the effects of that higher number of scale in terms of API server memory utilization, as well as all those um, informer uh, memory utilization. Um, it's a small uh, controller that runs on 
in the cluster or maybe it can, it can run outside the cluster as well. All it needs is a cube config and it will reconcile these objects instead of uh, instead of the actual kubelet running on, on that node. The key thing that might be interesting is that all of these uh, objects, they can be uh, divided into uh, stages. And internally how Quark works is there is an expression selector. So you can select that, okay, if the VMI is in, if the VMI dot status uh, equals to running or scheduled, and uh, if there is another, uh, let's say, uh, VMI dot status dot node name equals to a quark, a fake quark node name. If those conditions or those expressions match, then drive the the VMI to running state, right? So that's something you can declare as a stage uh, or or as a YAML to a quark, and then it will transition the the objects into uh, into different states based on that uh, declaration. So that's something uh, we can utilize to, you know, transition or control the transition in a timely manner um, through different objects like pods or, or PM. So with this, we can watch um, how the watch cache fills up and how the API server uh, memory CPU usage increases um, in, in a fairly cost-effective way. Going through um, how, like what would be the block diagram of this? Um, so on the right, you can see the stage that I was talking about in the earlier slide. What it matches here in this example is, it's going to look at the deletion timestamp and it's going to look at the phase. So if the VMI is in schedule phase and if the deletion timestamp does not exist, then with a delay of 15 seconds, uh, well, 10 to 15 seconds, it will transition this VMI to a uh, running state. So this is the example of uh, a stage uh, in, in the Quark uh, domain. And the way it works is there is a Quark uh, controller. It will process this stage then it will start a watch against um, VMIs. Whenever a VMI is found uh, in this state, it will make an update call to transition this uh, into running state. So currently upstream quark uh, only works on nodes and pods. Um, what I will be showing in today's demo is a VMI controller that is added to the, this quark project and this VMI controller only works on, on a stage uh, which, which is related to, to VMI. So I want to take a pause here. Um, are there any questions before we dive into demo? Okay. So, so this, this, this yeah. stage, so this is just another CR. The stage has a reference to an object. And then, um, okay, the key status phase. And then um, how does it record it? Like does the, um, so okay. I guess what I don't understand is like, you got a stage and it looks at the, the virtual machine instance. It's, it's, so it's like this CR, the way that clock understands how it should transition the different phases of an object. Yeah. Yes. So what it will do is it will get a resource reference from here, right? So it has a watch established on this particular uh, resource and whatever uh, instance of uh, this CRD, so a CR uh, matches this phase. So it has a matcher. Uh, so it will match this phase. So uh, let's say I create a fake VMI with uh, with metadata deletion not set and status in schedule, then it will immediately get that event, it will match it, and then it will process these two uh, items. So the next item is, okay, um, we are going to add a delay of 10 to 15 seconds. And then uh, we are, after that delay, 
we'll transition it to this. So this is a status template. So what I'm doing here is adding a condition ready and then adding a node name as well as uh, face running. So th this is kind of a template. Uh, this is Golang templates to be precise. And all of these information is available to that template filled by the, the controller. So when this okay. template will be rendered, it will make up a patch call and um, it will go ahead um, and make this transition. One thing to call out is that Kubert stack has a very strict vigilance on who makes patch calls to the status. So what I had to do is I had to uh, you had to impersonate word handler or word controller. I'm forgetting which component I did, but I had to impersonate a cube word user to make this uh, transition. Otherwise, all the patch calls were being rejected by, by the webhook. So um, whenever this, this call out is important, when we think about transitioning uh, this particular uh, PMI controller into a generic uh, controller that could reconcile any custom resource apart from pods. This is something it, I anticipate uh, it will cause problems because um, different projects will have different, uh, you know, ways of controlling the the patch patch update calls, uh, like we do have in Kubert. And, and so the. Um... This is the transition from scheduled to running. Do you have any other stages that you do? Uh, not in this example. Well, yeah, not we have not needed those in uh, in a VMI, but upstream Quark has similar stages for pods as well. Okay. Yeah, the reason I was wondering is because I think that determines which um, component we're we are um, simulating. I think the one, the stage you have would be the handler. And then, but the one, the stages before that, I think are done by the controller. That's but it correct. sounds like if you're able to get to schedule, then you're then we're gonna go through the real controller. Yes. Okay. The, the only reason why we needed to do this was, um, this is uh, the simulation that uh, we are implementing for the bartender. That that's yeah. exactly correct. Okay. So um, you know, once we have this, like, what is the benefits, right? That we get out of this. The benefits we get is that we'll be able to scale test changes in the Word API and Word Handler. Uh, we will not be able to, you know, scale test the um, changes in Word. Uh, sorry, word handler, um, because that's something we are simulating, right? So these components which fall into the control plane realm of things will be able to um, scale test those code changes. And again, we will be able to understand how um, those changes affect the the Kubert, like how those changes in Kubert stack affect the uh, Kubernetes control plane components like API server or uh, control, uh, even scheduler. Uh, next steps. So I think as the next steps, what I have in mind is we might, so the end goal I think is to have some kind of automated testing where we scale up a bunch of fake objects and run an end-to-end -end test, just like we do with the current benchmarks and get some numbers out of that, right? So in order to get started on that uh, end goal, I think the first thing we might have to do is there is a bunch of automation which sets up uh, a cluster and um, deploys a uh, cube word on it. So we can add a parameter to also uh, deploy a uh, quark um, if it is enabled, and then we can add an end-to-end -end test 
to you know create 100 fake nodes and and create um, 400 500 fake pmis whatever uh, number that we want to scale test this as so those are um, you know some of the initial uh, next steps i also had some areas of improvement so in the demo that i uh, showed earlier you can only see uh, the transition of of the the vmi so it's a life cycle of the vmi but there are certain load generators which are missing in in quark in general so if we look at all the uh, per node components right uh, kubelet word handler uh, all the CSI implementation or, or networking implementation, those are all you know informers and those create a watch list watch calls against the API server. So you can see in the example in the in the diagram below that from the Kubeword benchmarks, we have let's say a list node count, right? So certain components in the kubeword stack is making this um, list node uh, call against the api server so given that the the node is the fake node has no running component all the load generate or the load generated from that fake node from kubeword stack or kubernetes stack we will have to uh, simulate that load as well so in addition to the VMI controller, there is another uh, controller that we might have to add, which is a watch, um, well, load generator controller. And to start with, what I'm envisioning is that we will get an approximate of how much um, list and watch calls are being generated by each node, well, components running on each node and implement that fake uh, watch calls in in a controller on uh, in quark so that will generate enough uh, memory pressure against the api server and then we can compare uh, the real real api server usage with the simulation and make our simulation better this also gives us an opportunity to design the controller in such a way that we can account for the networking as well as storage components on, on the node, which will generate uh, the load. So we can start with KubeWord, but eventually we can you know simulate all the all the different components that are deployed on a node that helps reconcile the stack. Yeah, so that's what I have in, in areas of improvement. Cool, eh? Cool. Okay. Um, I have a simple, simple question. You probably just deployed the uh, Quark inside the cluster, right? That's correct, yes. Uh, uh -huh. How? How generic is the controller? On how much did you need to? How invasive was to have for you to have the VMI controller? Uh, it's it's as easy as um, writing a, a new controller in in, uh, in one of uh, you know Kubeword stack, right? So what I had to do was just uh, copy paste the the template controller, which which was pod controller, and then go make changes where I'll have to, you know, change um, pod objects with VMI objects. All the uh, the business logic that I was explaining earlier. Uh, let me show you here. So all the logic regarding this uh, processing the delay as well as processing the the template all of that is nicely abstracted out so i did not have to you know muck with dealing in in matching expression or dealing with delay 
those things were pretty easy. So I would say if we were, we are working on controllers a lot, uh, then we might find this easy to get onboarded. Um, one more, one more a thing to call out is the quark controllers. They do not use the normal normal informer cache mechanism uh, because it could become memory in intensive. So the developers have uh, implemented their own way of watching an object and and uh, triggering reconcile on that. Once we once you understand that, I think. Uh, all of the remaining things are fairly easy. Uh, yeah, um, and another thing, um, I did not at all have to change the other two controllers uh, in order to implement this. So in terms of going in and doing a surgery on, on the code base, this was just a pure addition uh, on top. Did you try to reach out to the maintainers if, if they would uh, accept this or? Um, would we need yeah. to um, maintain this uh, on our side? So I think uh, I, I reached out once for another bug, and they said they would be interested in making this generic. So instead of uh, the VMI controller, you can give any resource, right, except uh, pods and nodes, and, and it could work um, for that resource. So we could make this generic. However, I, I did call out a challenge, right? So Kubert is unique in the sense that we'll have to uh, impersonate Kubert users. But I mean, that's not an impossible thing to, you know, Come across. We'll have to find a way to, you know, make that generic controller mock. So maybe a, a mock user or something, a field here, and then all of this works on that mock user. So there is a way, and I think um, could the Quark community might be interested in adopting this and making it a, a generic solution. Yeah, I mean, if, if that would be accepted and uh, generalized, I think it's a, it's a great value because you can then extend that easily for other projects as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. Lugo, I asked them at KubeCon A, I asked the maintainer, there was a talk about it. Um, I, I'm pretty similar to what Alay was saying. I, I basically asked them if if they had thought about using, considering Qbert and, um, and I mean, I basically went into an explanation how Kubert's just a CRD, and how it doesn't really matter. Like it's, it's. Um, I mean, you can look at a pod as just another API, of just like a VMI. Is. So, the um, the concept was the same. And and so from their perspective, it was interesting. They the response I got was that needing to come up with like a um, that CRDs in general should be able to do this. It's just coming up with the right controllers to support it. So. Um, they were interested in, in having something like this. I, so, yeah, I mean, I think I think there's definitely a place for it. We'll just have to get, spend some time talking to them and figuring out, I think that the other thing you mentioned delay, right? Like the impersonation, how we do the permissions and how we do the often. Yeah, that's right. We'll have to find a generic way to make that, that work for all CRDs. Well, it's cool. That's pretty cool. Eh? Um, so do we, um, let me see. Um, so for, um, all right, so that was your demo. So do we, um, the next agenda item I have is to, for you, Lubo, talk about the hollow ver handler design and, and your progress. And do you have something that you want to share or talk about with that? Um, so I have started the work, but I, I'm not sure I, I have enough for to share today. Maybe next week. Uh, unfortunately, okay. I I had uh, some things come up too and had to work on that. Uh, but uh, Ale, I mean, if you are ready to incorporate this, uh, I think this is a, like QBCI could be a great place to. 
to basically uh, embed the quark into. Uh, so if you have a look on the CI repository, we already embed, for example, CDI or uh, or others, other projects. And uh, yeah, I would imagine to have it like this uh, as well for Quark. So uh, when you say embed, um, I sorry, I did not follow. Um, do you want to maintain like a fork of Quark until we get the, the generic controller or are you talking about something else? Uh, so for, uh, for, for for example, for CDI, we I think we do not need to uh, to download the whole image on uh, on each cluster app, and it's cached on it should be cached on the in the in, in the kubeCI node, and uh, we could do the same for the quark, so we don't need to basically fetch something from a third party in the CI and uh, uh, have a variable which would basically uh, effect if the quark should be deployed or not automatically. Yeah, makes sense. I think we'll also have to find uh, a place for this changes to live, right, upstream, uh, until until we get uh, quark folks to make a generic controller. Sure. So uh, I think it's fair if we if we just uh, do we have a six scale repository right now. If not, no. we, we we could have no. one, and we could have some tools, uh, and this would be one of them there. So it would be part of the cube where we could re leverage the probe uh, for building, uh, and, uh, testing, and publishing the image into a uh, cube weird uh, registry. It might be, well, if we go that route, um, it might be temporary. I mean, the hope is, right, that we get it uh... We merge it upstream, but but I guess um, and I guess we could always remove it later, right? But so yeah. so the um, do you think we will repo? So like a I guess we call it like a six scale repo like this, and that's where we put it, and then we we target it. We can that that's that would unblock a lay to to then integrate this with CI, but we because we have all our probes hooked up to this. So um, yeah. I ha I okay. actually had a question before, before this. So Brian, um, what what will happen is that until we we don't get that generic design right from from Quark folks, um, we will have to find a place to um, host the VMI controller core changes, and I wonder if we can, you know, host, like we can merge that in, in upstream Quark as an extension point until they can, you know, develop a generic control. Should we talk about that? I think that will save us a lot of um, uh, maintenance on, on our work and, and things like that. Yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's what I was, that's what I was thinking. Like, how can we, like, how can we do this so that we're we have visibility upstream, the quark upstream, and then, and then, it also allows us to develop and test. Um, and uh, maybe what ends up happening is we do have this, but it just has like um, a bunch of stuff that like recipes for launching clock or something, but the actual code is, is somewhere in, in the clock um, organization. Yeah, makes sense. So I think we'll have to go talk in that call, uh, discuss this. Maybe I can start with creating an issue discussion. And if, if that would not be acceptable, we can have the fork in secure good, I think. Well, I wonder even if I, I, yeah, we could, I, we, I was, I mean, I, I like the idea of like, if we, I feel like we wouldn't get denied for them to like, it, there's a good use case, right? Like getting, having a Qbert repo within that Qua community and then trying to get it eventually being gen, uh, generally supported. I guess, I mean, yeah, I think we start with an issue 
explain the problem. So explain we like to use we like we would like to use Quark. I think um I think it would be cool for you to do a demo too to them, Belay, showing that this is working, that we've written some code and you know we've done some investing into this. And then um and then I think we just need to negotiate with them to try and find um the right place. And I, I think this is what we want to push for, something that's in their orbit. And then um and for all we know, they might jump on the opportunity of saying, hey, we would like to immediately work on developing this controller, in which case that'd be great. Um, then we can help with that. But um, my sense is, is is that they may want at least us to do it or help contribute that feature. So what, a way to bootstrap our CI at the same time while we are we can help with that effort, we can have this project that sits as, a, as sort of a... Uh, uh, a use case uh, that that's uh, shows exactly how it would work, and then eventually we design around um, what we've done in that in the keyword and this whatever this project is called in the Quark community. Makes sense. Like so, um, so do you think in like? Yeah, I I think that sounds good. Uh, Maybe so. the The question I have is, if we want to get started on this work immediately for the current release, then I think it might be worth worth creating that fork, um, regardless of how that discussion goes, because I'm anticipating we'll need time to to discuss and and um, you know get some kind of agreement from from that community right uh so you, you already have depending code for on this. like you, yeah. you already have code. like we could just okay yeah i mean i guess that's true like if we have code for this we can just post it here and that could get us going and then we can try and push for this and, and yeah okay yeah makes sense Okay, uh, Lua, how do we, uh, I don't remember how we do this. How do we get, how do we request one of these repos in Qbert? Um, Just ask for, uh, ask them, Daniel or uh, Brian and they will help you out. Okay. Okay, all right, let's start with that. Do you want to start this thread or do you want me to do it? I can start it. So we do we need two repos? Uh one for six scale tools and one for the fork. I guess for now we need uh, just the fork, right? And um Okay. Let's let's see if we need the six scale. Okay. Yeah, I'll start for the fork then. I mean, I'll okay. start at third. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. All right. Anything else, guys? Uh, I think we've got one. Uh, probably one more meeting this this calendar year. Uh, I don't think we'll meet on the twenty first or the twenty eighth. So the the fourteenth will be our last one for twenty twenty four. So, okay, so Lubo, if you get the chance well, um, uh, to do this by the 14th, you get yeah, to aim so, for that date. Otherwise, we'll go, we'll, we'll carry it into 24. Yeah, so I'm looking at the code and basically marking each each point, which I know it's uh, um, touching the OS or trying to reach out to the pod and uh, still have yeah, some, some gaps to cover. Um, okay. But I will try to have some minimalistic. So, for example, without any network or or such. So, let's see. Hopefully, something will will come up from it. Okay. All right. Sounds good. We'll shoot for that then. All right, guys. I think if there's nothing else, I did here. Thanks, folks. Right. Thanks. Talk to you guys later. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye.